Bears are nature's vacuum cleaners. Though they're part of the same carnivora order as wolves and big cats, they have one of the most varied diets of any animal group, eating everything the natural world can provide, from berries and fungi to meat, fish and even insects. It's part of what has made bears such a successful and widespread group, with the brown bear in particular once roaming across the entire northern hemisphere. This makes the panda, with its vegan diet of bamboo, seem very odd indeed. These black and white beasts don't fit the bear blueprint, to the point that scientists didn't initially think they could be bears at all. Pandas were first discovered by a French missionary in 1869, and though originally described as Ursus melanleucus, or black and white bear, they were soon ousted from the Ursidae and placed in a separate family alongside the red panda, which also lives in China and has converged on many of the same adaptations, like large bamboo tree molars and a bony pseudo-thumb for gripping their favourite snack. Modern molecular methods eventually put an end to a century of debate. DNA demonstrates that pandas are indeed true bears, and red pandas more closely related to raccoons and weasels. But their diet remains a distracting puzzle. By adapting to eat the hard, woody stalks of bamboo, pandas have found a food source that won't run away. But because pandas are carnivora, and lack the robust guts and cellulose-degrading gut bacteria of more established herbivores, it's also a food source that they struggle to digest. This means in order to survive on bamboo, the panda has to stuff itself for 15 hours a day, and spend most of the rest of its time asleep. A bit like the koala, with its toxic eucalyptus habit, it's had to adopt a low-calorie lifestyle, conserving energy whenever possible. This addiction to bamboo combined with a legendary reputation for refusing to reproduce, has given the panda a very bad name. You don't have to look far to find advocates calling for their extinction. If the lazy pandas can't be bothered to continue their own species, why should we intervene, the argument goes. But if pandas are so bad at existing, then how did they evolve in the first place? How could natural selection shape a creature to be totally inept? Let's dive into panda evolution and find out exactly what we're missing. The story of the panda starts 19 million years ago, when it split off from the most recent common ancestor of the bears. Pandas were the first to diverge, making them the equally distant cousins of all other living bear species. The early history of the panda tribe is shrouded in mystery, and it's not until 11 million years ago, in the midst of the Miocene, that we find our oldest known panda relative, Quetzalcoatlus. Instead of China, Quetzalcoatlus lived in Western Europe, which had a warm tropical climate in this period. It was much smaller than modern pandas. In fact, it was even smaller than the sun bear, the most petite modern bear species. Like most small bears, Quetzalcoatlus was probably a good climber, and the scientists who named it think it mostly fed on plants and would scramble up trees to escape the large amphicyanid bear dogs that were the dominant predators of the age. Yet the animal's teeth, which along with its jaw is about all that's actually been found of Quetzalcoatlus, show that they had a much broader diet than their descendants. A recent study shows that grooves and wear on the teeth of this species are more comparable to omnivorous black and brown bears than to pandas. It's hard to pin down exactly what an omnivorous bear ate though, especially from just a handful of fossils, because the same species can have vastly different diets between regions, across seasons, and over extended periods of time. For instance, over the last 100 years, brown bears on the Japanese island of Hokkaido have gone from eating 60% meat to less than 10% meat, This is because the Hokkaido wolf was driven extinct, and the bears would get most of their meat by muscling in and stealing deer carcasses from the more fleet-footed predators. Without the wolves to catch their deer for them, the brown bears now mainly live off fruit and herbs. That's just one example that shows how this animal group can adapt to what's available in its habitat. It's likely the panda's ancestors could pull off the same trick, becoming more vegetarian when prey was in short supply, perhaps as a way to avoid competition with other species. If this way of life was sustained long term, they would gradually start to adapt for herbivory. Pandas stuck it out in Europe for a long time, with the last known species, Agriarctos nicolaevi, living up to 5 million years ago. It was a plant eater, but it didn't have strong enough teeth to crush the woody stalks of bamboo, and probably ate much softer vegetation. Long before the pandas died out in the west, they had already made the move to China, and this is where their bamboo eating seems to have got started. Iluarctos lived 8 million years ago, in China and Southeast Asia. Like a modern panda, its teeth were covered in complex grooves, which could mash through tough plant fibres, 
working a bit like a meat tenderizer. But we have more than just teeth to talk about now, with the first appearance in the fossil record of the panda's strange sixth digit, its makeshift thumb. This thumb is actually a massively expanded wrist bone, the radial sesamoid, which works like a pincer, helping pandas grip bamboo tightly while their jaws go to work. When you need to eat 100 pounds of bamboo a day, anything that makes the process more efficient becomes an invaluable survival tool. Iluarctos actually had a larger grip than modern pandas, and over time the fake thumb grew shorter and more hook-shaped. Scientists think this was to prevent it protruding too much, and to present a flatter surface to the ground, allowing modern pandas to keep a strong grip while not hampering their ability to walk. The red panda also has the bamboo-grasping pseudo-thumb, and while it's initially bamboozled, it's now held up as an amazing example of conversion evolution. The two species both came to eat bamboo, so they evolved the same tool. But that may not be the whole story. While the red panda's wrist bone thumb definitely grew large to help the animal hold stalks, scientists now think it was originally used for locomotion. The fossil record shows red pandas had this feature before they became bamboo eaters, so it probably developed to help them grip slender branches, much like us apes and our opposable thumbs. In the panda with its patchy fossil record, the origins are less clear, but because the spectacled bear also has a small pseudo thumb, and this was the second bear species to split off from the common ancestor, some scientists think this digit was an original feature of the Ursid family, one that was then lost in the Ursinae bears. With the bears' large body sizes, they wouldn't have been nimbly scampering across thin branches, so their thumbs probably did develop for manipulating food, but for grasping plants that weren't bamboo. One last wrinkle, some distantly related carnivorans like the palm civet and Jeanette also have large radial sesamoids, so it's just about within the realm of possibility that this was actually an ancient climate adaptation of the very earliest tree-dwelling carnivorans from 60 million years ago, one that was then lost in many species to allow for faster movement on the ground. But for whatever its origins, the Iloarctus thumb size, combined with its strong teeth, suggests that by now pandas had bamboo on their menus. But we have to jump forward in time to see the first appearance of another trademark feature, their mighty jaws. Yes, you heard that right. Pandas have very powerful mouths, with one of the strongest bites of any bear species. A panda's massive head may make it look sweet, but its purpose is to allow room for large jaw and cheek muscles, which it uses for some serious chewing. Pandas have highly reinforced skulls, to withstand the forces their awesome jaws throw out. Their skulls are stronger than polar bears, which mainly eat the soft, nutrient-rich blubber of seals, and don't crunch on bone. While they may look harmless, Panda's strong bites make them dangerous when provoked, and there are many cases of pandas attacking people who underestimated them. Over a span of four years, one panda called Gugu in Beijing Zoo hospitalized three visitors foolish enough to enter his enclosure, each time treating the intruder's legs like big pink bamboo stalks to be chomped on. In one of these attacks, Gugu bit through to the bone and zoo staff had to use tools to pry its jaws open. We start to get really good skull remains from about 2 million years ago, with the species Ilipoda microta. Considered close enough to the modern panda to be part of the same genus, its skull shape is very similar, showing that this aspect has stayed largely the same since at least the late Pliocene. It was a smaller animal though, only about two thirds the size of a modern panda, at one metre in length. Entering the Pleistocene we meet the imposing Ilipoda baconi, which was very similar to modern pandas, only larger. It seems these bears tried out a couple of different sizes before landing on one that was just right. Now we've followed the pandas from their European origins to their current form, but we still haven't solved the mystery of when they became bamboo-only feeders. It seems the foundations for holding and chewing bamboo were laid millions of years ago, but one study which examined chemical isotopes in ancient panda teeth found they had more varied herbivorous diets as recently as 5,000 years ago, so perhaps the switch was more recent. Scientists have worked out how pandas survive on bamboo despite their simple stomachs and short guts though. By looking at what pandas eat on the nutrient level, we figured out they're getting roughly as much of their energy from protein as hypercarnivorous animals like wolves and cats. They do this by being selective, prioritizing different types of bamboo and different parts of the plant throughout the year, migrating between different altitudes in their mountain habitats to follow the protein-rich young shoots. So the question why pandas eat bamboo maybe starting with a false assumption, that there's something wrong with bamboo. While they're less active than other bears as a result of their diet, 
pandas can get the energy and nutrition they need from bamboo alone, and the plant is abundant and grows incredibly fast. And because no other animal, not even the red panda, can tackle their tough stalks the way giant pandas can, they avoid competing for their dinner. It's true they have to eat for long periods to get enough food, but that's true of many plant-eating species, especially large animals like gorillas, giraffes, elephants, and pandas. It's not a unique weakness. I also found a study from 2025 that suggests another utterly bizarre possibility that bamboo may actually want to be eaten. Chinese researchers took blood from pandas and found 57 different microRNAs which come from bamboo in the animal's bloodstream. These microRNAs do all sorts of things, regulating genes by stopping particular proteins from being produced. But some of the bamboo ones the scientists found in pandas affect dopamine metabolism and the processes through which smells are converted into a signal in the brain. The idea here is that material from bamboo has hopped over to pandas and is making bamboo smell better, taste better and feel good to eat. It's completely unbelievable and I can't find anyone else really talking about it so it feels like this might have been a strange fever dream but no, here it is in a proper scientific paper. Here's the theory it was based on from 2023. Weird, weird and wacky sci-fi type stuff. It would be interesting to consider an alternative history for the panda. Imagine a spec evo project exploring a sister species to these bears one that not only maintained an omnivorous diet, but actually became more carnivorous over time, eventually giving rise to a hunter-killer panda that terrorized the plains of some other continent, say North America. Okay, now stop imagining it, because all of that actually happened. After the pandas split from the rest of the bear lineage, they split again. We followed the branch of Ilopodini, because that's the one that gave rise to the pandas. But the Agrotherini went in a very different direction, The earliest known species, the omnivorous Indarctos, lived 11 million years ago, just like Kretzoyarctos. But while that bear is walking the path towards herbivory, Indarctos is its twisted mirror image. Meat became a steadily more important part of its diet. These renegade path pandas would culminate in the late Miocene with the hurricane genus. Sometimes described with the epic name Storm Bear, this apex predator had a massive skull and strong canines for shearing through flesh and bone. It also had long limbs. Rather than opportunistic hunters like black and brown bears, Hurricane would chase down its prey like a lion, using its immense bulk to bring down anything it could catch. Hurricane was very successful and survived in North America until about 4 million years ago. The cause of its extinction is not exactly clear. But what is clear is that on the other side of the world, the pandas with their plant-based diets were soldiering on. So we've established that bamboo is not so bad. But what about their lack of interest in the opposite sex? Surely that can't be a good survival trait. Well, it turns out this is just panda slander. It's more or less a myth. The idea that pandas are sex shy has been around since at least the 1940s, when the first specimens in American zoos sparked headlines like this one from Life magazine. But this was hardly fair, unbiased treatment from the press, because it turned out the animals they were trying to mate were both male. Another high-profile example was London Zoo's famous Chi-Chi, one star of a children's TV show and now still in the spotlight but looking rather less lively at the Natural History Museum, Chi Chi was hand reared by keepers. As a result, the panda sexually imprinted on the wrong species. This deviant preferred humans to other bears. With famous failures like this one, it's not hard to see why the reproduction rumours stuck. Pandas are very hard to breed in captivity. Obviously that makes conservation efforts tricky, but it's true for thousands of other animals, from cheetahs to leafy sea dragons and even other bear species like sun bears. It's also true that female pandas are only fertile for a few days a year, but that's again also true for elephants, moose, and brown bears. It's a strategy that ensures offspring are born at the right time of year, and in the wild it doesn't present a problem. In short, there's nothing especially unusual about pandas' mating habits. Their population has shrunk not because of a design flaw, but because of habitat destruction, which has restricted their range to a small band of mountainous terrain in central China. The panda's population collapse maps onto the rise of agriculture in our own ancient history, as well as the increased deforestation in recent years. Panda numbers have recovered recently, from 1,100 to 1,900, and as a result they've become a symbol of conservation. But the fact is, rather than graciously rescuing the pandas from their own design flaws, we're the villains that put them on the brink in the first place. Evolutionary, the pandas were doing fine. <laughs>